Hi there, and welcome to Inside Quantum, the podcast telling the human stories behind the latest developments in quantum technologies. I'm Dr. Stephen Thompson, and I'll be your host. In this episode, I'm really happy to be joined by Dr. Ihui Kwek, a postdoctoral researcher and Humboldt fellow working in the field of quantum information. Ihui, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me here. Okay, so you're here as a researcher working broadly in the field of quantum information, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so... What first got you interested in quantum physics? Well, I guess I was, I went to a math and science high school when I was growing up in Singapore. And so I was always interested in physics and math. And my high school had this requirement that we had to do research in order to graduate. So I did a small research project with a with someone who's currently a professor in Singapore, uh, Dr. Hui Kun Ng. And even though my research project wasn't on quantum and she was mostly working on quantum, I kind of like was always interested to hear about what she was actually working on. And so I guess just kind of by diffusion, I learned a bit about quantum and it sounded very interesting. And when it was time for me to study physics or when it was time for me to go to university, I chose to study physics and I went to MIT. So MIT is pretty strong at everything to do with quantum science and technology. So it was a pretty natural choice for me. So what was this uh, research project that you did in high school? Can I oh, ask? it was on compressive sensing. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I built a single pixel camera. Wow. I, probably the only time I've ever successfully done an experimental research project. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I wish I'd done things like that in my high school. Yeah, nice. it, was, it was super interesting. I learned a lot about signal processing, which, I mean, it isn't totally unrelated to physics. There's a lot of matrices involved. Mm -hmm. And so I got a taste of linear algebra at that point as well. <laughs> and it didn't scare you off? No, it was actually it was actually super cool. I think it was just the right mix of um, being hands on and being theoretical. So I could see that the single pixel camera I built was reconstructing images very well, and I was curious about how we could do that with just a single pixel. So it was really an excellent project to introduce me to the fundamentals of signal processing. Nice. So then, from Singapore to MIT, why did you decide to go there? Was it just the reputation or were there any specific opportunities that MIT offered you that other places didn't have? So I think my answer to this comes in two parts. The first part is that just going out of Singapore was a life-changing opportunity in itself. And the reason for that is that I had already spent by that time 18 years in Singapore. And when you live in one particular place for so long, you become so optimized for that particular environment that you lose your ability to adapt when your environment changes. Mm -hmm. And this is all okay when you're young, but um, as you get older, I, th I tend to believe that you have very little control over the kinds of events that could be, um, that could be sudden changes in your environment and you have to gain the ability to adapt to them and mm -hmm. um, make corresponding adjustments in how you behave and your psychology. And so I feel that moving to a different country was a very good way for me to learn that kind of skill. Um, so that was why I chose to leave Singapore. And as for why MIT in particular, uh, I think that something I learned from MIT, which I find very invaluable, even today, is the idea that I actually have a great degree of control over my own environment. And um, I can do things that change my environment for the better. And so what I learned was this whole idea of ground up initiative. I think growing up in Singapore, I was fortunate to be in a place of not only a lot of material privilege, but also I think that I happened to be lucky to be in an environment that prized the qualities that I already possessed. Namely, I think that in Singapore, as in many Asian societies, um, having the ability to get good grades in school is actually it actually puts you very far ahead in life. And because of that, uh, I felt that I was always able to kind of cruise without thinking too much about what I would like to change in my environment. But when I got to MIT, of course it was still the case that it was important to maintain good grades, but I also came into contact with a lot of people who had a lot of what you would call side hustles in the sense that they were not only getting good grades, but they were also kind of using their skills to make a real impact to their communities. And I was very inspired by this. For example, one of my dorm mates is Thai. And um, at the time that we started at MIT, Thailand had just experienced some really bad floods. And 
I saw that he had actually made a difference to these efforts by programming an Android app to um, enable users to share their geolocation data so that um, in the event of these floods, they could uh, help other people and also be helped. So uh, I was very inspired by that. And I think I've come away now with the um, with a lot more willingness to kind of be the change I want to see in whatever environment I'm in. So moving to another country then, it, it was a really life-changing opportunity. I think it was a really life-changing experience and I would recommend it to, to everyone else. At what point did you decide that you wanted a career in quantum physics rather than just studying it for interest? At what point did you decide, no, this is it. This is something I actually really want to pursue and I really want to work on properly long term. I wouldn't say that there was one particular point. It was more of a gradual transition. Actually, when I started my PhD, I was going to do classical information theory. and But this was already after a bit of experience in my undergrad with quantum information. So I had taken a class at MIT with Peter Shore. And as the final project for that class, I wrote a review of part of the Nielsen and Chuang textbook, basically the parts to do with um, quantum information measures. And I had found that very interesting, but when I started my PhD, it didn't immediately occur to me that I wanted to um, do quantum information. And in America, the PhDs are very um, freestyle, I would say. Like, you don't have to commit to something or you don't have to commit to a particular group before you start. And so it was definitely a conscious choice for me to go into quantum information or rather to go back into quantum information. And I think I'm, I'm still refining my subfield within quantum information. I think at the start of my PhD it was more about quantum Shannon theory and now I'm going more towards quantum learning theory. So I, I think along with this refinement is also the fact that I'm finding myself enjoying what I do more and more. <laughs> so that's probably a good sign. But to come back to your question, I don't think uh, there was any one moment when I told myself, okay, I'm going to be a quantum physicist from now on. So for you, it was a, a gradual... It's a gradual learning process and a gradual increase of my enjoyment levels as well. Oh, nice. That's fantastic to hear. Yeah, and I hope it continues increasing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. Okay, so you mentioned a couple of aspects of what it is that you do. So before we dig too deeply into what any of these subfields are, can you tell us what what's the big picture? What's the area of research that you work in and what's your contribution towards this big picture? Mm -hmm. So I think... There's the big, big picture, which is to build a quantum computer, a working quantum computer. And then there's the big, but not so big picture, which is kind of like an intermediate picture, which is to get a working prototype of something that resembles a quantum computer. <laughs> and that's the stage that we're at now. Okay. And I think a lot of what I do is working in this intermediate picture. So what we have right now are not quantum computers, but we have quantum processors consisting of on the order of 100 qubits. And of course, for a working quantum computer, you would need like much more qubits than that. I think to run Shor's algorithm, you would need on the order of 1,000 uh, logical qubits, which is like a million non-error-corrected qubits or something like that. But the point is what we have now is much fewer qubits than what we want. And so the question is, what can we already do with so few qubits? And a lot of what I do is revolving around that question. The thing is that with our current quantum processors, I'm going to call them quantum processors because they're not actually quantum computers. Okay, sure. Um, they're so small and they, they suffer from a lot of noise. So it's, and I think when people were writing all these early quantum algorithms, they definitely did not bank on there being so much noise. And so a lot of quantum computation is built on the assumption that you're running an error corrected quantum computer. And so my the question I'm trying to answer is what can you do even if you're not running an error corrected quantum computer? And more than that, if you're running a super noisy and super small quantum processor. So I use concepts from classical learning theory, uh, classical statistics uh, and information theory, both quantum and classical, to kind of answer this question. And it's a really interesting question that sits at the intersection of physics and computer science because you need physical concepts to understand how quantum mechanics works in the presence of noise. And you also need computer science to kind of like figure out how to make that into an algorithm or what kinds of limitations you can expect in this kind of regime. Okay. So I really enjoyed that. Okay, I see, I see. So the, the question really is what can we do with 
current generation processors. Yes, we're, and what can we not do? That's yeah, also very important. What can we not do? Yeah, so we're, we're on the way towards a quantum computer, but we're not there yet. We're taking yes. the first steps. Okay, so you mentioned there a couple of times noise and error correction. Where does this noise come from? Why are quantum computers noisy? What's the problem with having a, a thousand qubit processor? Well, I think a lot of the noise basically comes from the fact that qubits like to entangle themselves with their environments. And I think you know this a lot better than me, but uh, I think what I work with are mostly models of noise, but the intuition behind these models is the fact that we don't really have fine enough control of our qubits to make sure they are um, behaving in the way we would, we would want to operate them, as you would need to do if you were really building a, a, a quantum computer. And so, yeah, maybe you can talk more about why, why these, things are, why these uh, quantum processors are so noisy. <laughs> well, I guess the point here is that it's difficult to control things on a quantum level, isn't it? That, yeah. Uh, it's, it's easy enough to work with classical electronics and to assemble them all into bigger and bigger structures, more and more complex structures. But these quantum degrees of freedom, these quantum bits, qubits, they're so small that it's kind of hard to get them to do what you tell them. They like to, right. to yeah, entangle with their environment. They like to pick up environmental effects and decohere. And it's very difficult to get them to stay in the state that you want them to stay in. Is that mm -hmm. a fair statement? I think that's a fair statement. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then, so your work is, is about understanding the limitations of the equipment that we have now, maybe overcoming these limitations, mm -hmm. and figuring out what can we really do with this this kind of first first generation of quantum hardware. Can yeah, you could the call first? them that. I yeah. think. Okay, so we've covered a little bit about what it is that you're doing at the moment. If you weren't doing this, if you hadn't gone down this route of quantum information, quantum computing, what do you think you would have done instead? Well, I think I enjoy communicating a lot. I enjoy writing. And so I think I could be a science journalist. No, I nice. particularly enjoy reading the articles from Quanta. Do you know about Quanta? I do. They, they write some excellent They have some amazing articles. articles. They really do, yes. Yeah. And I've learned a lot from reading these articles. And I think it's like, well, at least in my experience, it's one of the best science journalism outfits. So I would want to be a science journalist for an outfit like Quanta. But also, I think I could be a data science journalist. And what I have in my mind now is this um, political website, uh, 538. Uh, yes, I've heard of it. Yes. And I think it could be very cool to work for such an outfit because you not only spend time crunching numbers, but you also kind of make a political commentary out of that. And I think that would be a really good... Um, combination of things that I really like, numbers and writing. <laughs> so it's not just about about the maths or about the the physics. It's also about the meaning behind it. Of what meaning can you extract from this big pile oh, of statistics and data, and how can you communicate that to an audience who might not be so literate in, in data science but mm -hmm. want to know the story behind the data? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I th in fact, I think as as scientists, it's easy to kind of get lost in the I guess math or the beauty of math. But I think it's also important to communicate your findings to a wider audience. And I think that that's not only um, good for getting funding, but it, it also often when you try and um, form a narrative around your work, it makes it makes it clear in your own mind. So I really enjoy that. Yeah, definitely. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think to explain a concept properly, you need to understand it yourself. Mm -hmm. And sometimes until you try to explain it, you don't realize that you don't understand it. Yeah, exactly. You can be so used to just talking in jargon with other people in the field. And then when you have to explain one of these technical terms, you realize, wait a minute, I, I don't know what that means. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in simple words. <laughs> In fact, I think it was Alan Guth at MIT who, who once um, gave us a piece of advice when he was teaching one of our classes. He said, the best way to learn this material is to teach it to someone else. And if you don't have someone else to teach it to, just pretend there's someone else there. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like some pretty good advice. Yeah. Okay, so we covered a little bit about what you did at high school and going to MIT. Can you tell us a little bit about the type of work that you did while you were at MIT, the kinds of things you were interested in, and then how that led on to your PhD and what you worked on during your PhD? So, as I mentioned, um, at MIT in my last semester, sorry, the last semester of my junior year, which is my third year, I took a class on information theory and it was taught by Peter Shaw, Peter Shaw. And as part of that class, well, it was a class on classical information theory, but 
at the end of it, I had the opportunity to write a sort of a review article on quantum Shannon theory, which is like a quantum version of information theory, where instead of manipulating probability distributions, you're manipulating density matrices, which are like a quantum generalization of probability distributions. Mm, okay. And at the end of my time at MIT, I also had the opportunity to write a senior thesis with Peter. And that was on studying something called super quantum correlations. Super quantum, wow, that's yeah. a term I'm not so familiar So even with. more quantum than, than <laughs> more, quantum correlations. More quantum than quantum, nice. Exactly. Okay. And so we managed to find an application to a communication protocol. And so all of that was very interesting. And when I went to Stanford, um, I knew I was interested in information theory. And so I guess I started out trying to work on the link between information theory and biophysics. Oh, nice. But then I realized that I, there wasn't really anyone at Stanford who was doing that. So I then went back to what I was more familiar with, which was quantum information theory. And then I, I wrote a couple of papers on studying uh, classical feedback over quantum channels. And I think I asymptoted to quantum computing in the end because, well, this was not related to my paper, but uh, but I, I felt that quantum computing was um, an area that had tremendous growth potential and tremendous number of opportunities. Mm -hmm. and, of, and of course, all of this was, um, while all of this was happening, Google had just made their announcement about um, their, uh, their very first quantum supremacy experiment. And I think, that really opened my eyes to the number of new questions that would be enabled by by this new technological breakthrough. And so that's why I decided to eventually work more on quantum computing. And oh, something that's very interesting. Why do why is it that I like learning theory so much? Well, I think it's because I went to Stanford for my PhD. And at Stanford, everyone, <laughs> and by everyone, I mean like 90% of people, including humanities majors, take the machine learning course. Oh, really? Yes. Machine learning is a very big thing in Silicon Valley. <laughs> oh yes, I can I can believe that. <laughs> exactly, and so I also took the machine learning course, even though I was in the physics department. Um, and um, I mean, I took one of the many machine learning courses that they offered, and I think this was my very first introduction to kind of the um, or kind of the field of learning theory. And I realized that learning theory is not just useful for explaining why classical machine learning works so well, but it's also kind of a more fundamental kind of theory that um, can explain or can be adapted to many more computational situations, including um, what I'm currently using it for, which is to characterize quantum systems and quantum states. I see. Wow, that's pretty comprehensive then. Yeah, there's a lot of different concepts all mixing together yes. in your research, all coming together in a really interesting way. Okay, mm -hmm. so you briefly mentioned there um, quantum supremacy, which I think is sometimes also called quantum advantage. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about what that is and why it's so important? Right, so I think a lot of its importance is um, more that it's a benchmark for quantum computing because it's the first time that a quantum device has been able to perform a task that a classical device cannot. And even and, and the thing to note is that the task that this quantum device has performed is a completely useless task. <laughs> it's basically sampling from some kind of probability distribution that you wouldn't be able to sample from so quickly if you only had a classical computer. I see. Is, is it a controversial statement to say that it's a useless task? No, or it's this, not. Uh, it's widely accepted secret. that it's useless. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But it's the first time a, a quantum system has been able to do something a classical system could not. So yes. It's, it's still a landmark in, in that sense. Yes, okay. exactly. I see. I see. Okay. And then part of what you're doing with trying to understand how these quantum computers work and what they can be used for, I guess, is finding more cases where quantum systems can have this advantage over classical systems. More right, cases exactly. where they do things that, that other systems until now have never been able to do. Exactly. And I think one of the most promising candidates for quantum advantage, or like the candidate that seems to have convinced most people, is basically simulation of other quantum systems. So I, I think it was Feynman who said something like, um, oh my gosh, at this point you have to insert the, the Feynman quote. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll put something about videos. simulating nature, and by golly, it's a wonderful computational problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I know the quote that you're referring yes. to. Yes. I know the one. 
Yes, and I think it's an open problem and a very interesting one to figure out if even now with our current quantum processes, we can already simulate a small part of nature. Yeah, I mean, that certainly seems like a very worthy goal. So coming from more of the many body physics side, mm -hmm. if you want to exactly simulate a quantum system beyond about, I don't know, 20 or 30 electrons, suddenly you need more memory than even supercomputers have. By the time you get to 40 electrons, you, you just give up all hope. So, mm -hmm. you know, classically being able to simulate these large systems seems entirely hopeless. So being able to use quantum devices to directly access this quantum physics and directly simulate the things that we're interested in. Yeah, I, you've convinced me, I'm sold. <laughs> I think it's, it's a very worthy cause indeed. Great, you want to write a paper together? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess one thing I would ask, not being in this field, you've used the phrase learning theory a couple of times. Can you maybe give us a kind of quick definition of what you mean by learning theory? Ah, yes. Very good question. So... It's been observed that, okay, so I guess we're at a period of time when, when machine learning and AI is at the forefront of our consciousness. But the thing is that they are extremely effective and we don't know why. Hmm. And some, some people have even gone so far as to, as to term this the unreasonable effectiveness of machine learning. And learning theory is kind of an attempt to build a theoretical framework that explains why it's easier to learn some kinds of, well, it's easier to learn some things than others. Okay, I see. Okay. So machine learning really is just a, a black box then? Yeah. Okay. And learning theory is one of the candidates for opening this black box. Okay, I see. I always had the impression, being slightly outside this field, that people who worked on machine learning knew how it worked. And it was just people, people like me who heard some of the buzzwords and, and uh, were aware that it existed, but I thought it was just, you know, outsiders didn't know how it worked, but the people who worked on it, they had a good idea. But you're telling me that actually, no, no one, no one knows how it works. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's been a lot of progress in understanding how it works. Okay, I see. I think, in fact, one criticism of learning theory is that it's too theoretical and it makes certain assumptions that aren't really met in real life, but it's still a useful theory. <laughs> Does it only apply to, to things like machine learning or does it also apply to, for example, uh, you know, children learning in school or to, to the way that humans learn things? Oh, um, that's a very good question. I think learning theory is a theory that was built in the image of machine learning, but it can definitely be applied to other kinds of learners. Oh, interesting. Um, but I think if you wanted to make it applicable to children learning things in school, you would have to relax some of the assumptions. Like, for example, one of the assumptions of learning theory is that it studies the behavior of learners, but a learner is modeled as something that collects a sample of the kind of thing that it's trying to learn. And instead of saying thing that it's trying to learn, I'm going to call it a concept. Okay, sure. So statistical learning theory, which I'm calling learning theory, mm -hmm. models the learner as um, an entity that is able to observe the unknown concept in a certain very structured way. Mm -hmm. And this way of the learner ob uh, observing the concept is by observing a certain, so a concept is a function that maps from a domain to a range and the learner kind of um, picks or well not necessarily picks but let's say picks okay the learner picks certain points in the in the domain and then it observes what the unknown concept maps to on those points mm -hmm. but it doesn't observe the unknown concept itself and it's supposed to figure out what that is but anyway my point was that this is a very structured way of learning and uh, it may be the case that when you want to think about a child learning a concept, that's not how a child actually observes the concept. <laughs> okay, so kids are messy and unstructured is the takeaway yes, from this. Yes, and they may, yeah. Okay, okay, so I see. The theory is developed for machine learning, may have more general uses, but to get to those more general uses, probably we have to relax a lot of these assumptions yes. and uh, abstract away a little bit from the, right. the current theory. Okay, okay. You've talked about working in, in quantum information and quantum computation. You've talked a little bit about learning theory. What do you think the biggest outstanding challenge in your field is at the moment? Let's say in the near future. Okay, the end goal is probably to, to you know, construct a quantum computer, but let's say five to 10 years, what do you think the biggest outstanding challenge in your field is? Well, I've talked about this a little bit just now, but I think the biggest intermediate skill challenge is to find applications for, or find use cases for uh, noisy quantum computers. 
So if we could find such an application that would give us more confidence that we should continue investing in quantum computing research and build bigger ones and better ones. Okay, I see, I see. And what happens if we don't find any signs of quantum advantage? Well, I think that even if we don't find or... I think that the different potential applications have different um, levels of plausibility. I think it's quite likely that we will find a quantum advantage in simulation. Um, it's less clear to me that we will find a quantum advantage in the other use cases. Um, I'm particularly interested, of course, in the quantum advantage in machine learning, but I think there's still a lot that needs to be really hammered out before we can conclusively say that there is a quantum advantage there. Okay, I see. And if... Uh if we were to suddenly find this quantum advantage, what would be your hope for the impact that this would have outside of the research community? Because I could see, for example, quantum simulation, being able to, to accurately simulate quantum systems is something that would interest a lot of people in research. It certainly interests me. But for people who are not maybe working in quantum technologies or you know, not at all interested in the, the math and the physics of it, what would you hope that the impact of a discovery like this would be on, on the wider world? Hmm... I'm not sure that it would have a direct impact on most people. I think um, what I can envision is a future in which um, maybe part of a computer that people are using is quantum, but it's only it's kind of like only a part that that serves the specialized purpose for which the quantum computer is good for. I don't think we would be able to use quantum processors to like run Microsoft Word, for instance. Okay, so a bit like we have a, our computers these days have, uh, you know, CPUs, we have right. GPUs, we have yeah, specialized components. Mm -hmm. You can think of having a QPU, I guess, a quantum right, processing right, unit, exactly. something like that, that just sits in the corner and does specific quantum tasks, like, I don't know, cryptography or something. Yeah. Something like this. Okay, that's interesting. I've never heard a suggestion like that before. I always had the idea that quantum computers would be very large things living in labs somewhere solving very specific problems. I never kind of had the had the impression that you could, yeah, just, just take quantum computers for what they're good for and then build that into real technologies. That's a really interesting thought. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so we've talked a little bit about your journey so far. So you started in Singapore, then you moved to MIT for your undergrad and then to Stanford for your PhD. Mm -hmm. And you're now here in Berlin. You've been here now for how many months now? Three months, six months? Five months. Five months, okay. You've been here for five months. So I guess it's safe to say that you've worked in quite a few different countries and very different cultures. Mm -hmm. You've worked in several different countries to this point, and I think it's safe to say that they're all very different to each other. Have you experienced any form of, let's say, culture shock, any surprises in moving from one country to another, and anything that you've discovered that you didn't expect before you moved to one of these countries, be it in academia or just in the, the broader culture of the country? Yes, so I've already talked about how there's a lot of technological optimism in Silicon Valley. And I think the social attitude towards new things or wild claims is very different here in Germany. I think people here tend to exercise a lot more skepticism when they encounter something that seems too good to be, to be true. And I think um, this doesn't just apply to technology, but it's an attitude that's kind of prevalent even in daily life. For example, I'm currently writing a paper with some colleagues here in the ISAT group, and I'm always surprised by how much time we spend agonizing over every sentence to make sure that we're not overselling our results. Mm -hmm. So um, I think this kind of... So I think there are upsides and downsides to both approaches. On the one hand, I think um, the American enthusiasm can act as a sort of inoculation against the fear of failure, whether it's in their work or in their personal lives. But on the other hand, I think the German attitude of sobriety and um, kind of more moderation uh, also comes in handy when you want to evaluate the claims made by someone else and yeah, see whether it's true. So ideally, I would like to combine both of these approaches. I would like to have the American exploratory spirit when it comes to uh, doing experiments to figure out certain things about myself or my environment. But I think when it comes to reflecting on the results of those experiments, I would like to uh, have more of the German sobriety. That sounds like a, a good and very necessary balance to have, I suppose. Uh, it wouldn't do to be 
completely depressed about all future technologies <laughs> and insist everything be perfect all of the time. But equally, yes, I guess you can have uh, you can have crazy ideas flying high without having something to to really underpin them. So yeah, that sounds mm-hmm. like a. Mm-hmm. A very necessary balance. And in terms of social attitudes, I've also noticed a difference between America and Germany. So I think in America, or at least in California, there's a lot of talk about um, diversity. Mm-hmm. And the reason for this is that I feel that in America, demographics are quite central to people's identities. So people are always very conscious of like what race they are, what gender they are, and they're very conscious about the history, about the historical background of their ancestors, as well as the challenges that people of the same identity as them are currently facing. Mm -hmm. Um, And this comes up a lot in conversations in America. Whereas I feel that it doesn't so much here in Germany. And I think this may have something to do with the fact that many people in America have immigrant backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's fair to say that it really is a more diverse place Um, And so that's why there's more opportunities for these different identities to kind of rub against each other and potentially cause conflict. Mm -hmm. So that's another difference I've perceived. And I think it would kind of be, I mean, I would prefer to see more more considerations of people's identities in, in Germany as well. So yeah, for example, I think this is one of the other questions you were going to ask me, Mm -hmm. but I, I noticed that especially in in physics, it tends to be very male-dominated here in Germany. Mm-hmm. And I think that I didn't really notice this when I was studying in America because like, um, I think there's more efforts to kind of promote diversity in the workplace in America. I mean, it was definitely still male-dominated, but the gender ratio wasn't as extreme as it is here. And do you think that this is due to efforts in America to promote diversity that are not quite so prevalent here in Germany? Well, it certainly isn't talked as much about here. And I think part of this is due to the same kind of skepticism that I mentioned earlier, where I think maybe the German image of a stereotypical Yankee is like being all talk and no action. And maybe that can be an impediment Mm -hmm. to people even starting the conversation. But I just wanted to point out that it's actually important for efforts to promote diversity to be part of an ongoing conversation. And personally, as someone who has um, lived in both kinds of environments, I think that it makes a real difference to my own experience when uh, this sort of thing is common knowledge. And when I say common knowledge, I mean it in the philosophical sense, where you say a concept is common knowledge if not only everyone knows it, but everyone knows that everyone else knows it and everyone knows that everyone knows that everyone else knows it, and so on ad infinitum. And the reason I think it's important for these kinds of things to be common knowledge is that when you know that everyone else knows it, then that becomes the foundation on which you can begin to start discussing how to correct it. And so I think that maybe the very first step that needs to be taken is for um, these efforts to become common knowledge, uh, even here in Germany. And I would say that that is a necessary but not sufficient condition for real change to happen. So in your experience so far, I guess across all countries, as you say, the physics in particular has been a very male-dominated field for a long time. To me, it feels like things are improving, but we still have a long way to go. In your experience, do you think things have changed over your career at all? Well, I think maybe things have changed because I was, I myself was moving towards environments that I felt were better Mm -hmm. and more nurturing for um, my own personality. Um, So at Stanford, I was actually hanging out quite a bit with computer scientists. Mm, I see. And actually, I felt that in theoretical computer science, the gender ratio is really good in Stanford. And Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's because Stanford has managed to hire a lot of really excellent female faculty in computer science. In the Stanford Computer Science Department and its affiliates, um, I know of at least two women who are, I think, doing a fantastic job in increasing representation and making women feel really at home. So these people are Mary Wouters and Salil Schramm. Salil is actually from the Department of Statistics. But um, just before I left, they had started this initiative called the Women's Theory Forum, which was a monthly get together for women in like the theoretical computer science and like related fields to kind of share about their research and it it just felt very 
it just like it just felt like a very natural thing to do and I really enjoyed these gatherings. So and and also not only women were invited to, to these gatherings. Of course men were also very very welcome. So I feel like these are the sorts of things that we need to have here in Germany as well. Okay, so I guess um you've talked a little bit about gravitating towards environments that you felt were particularly productive and nurturing for you. What would you say to any other women in particular wanting to get into a field like physics, computer science, um, one of these fields that looks very male-dominated and indeed is very male-dominated, would you have any advice for women looking to get into these fields about where they could look to find a similarly um, nurturing experience as you've had? Mm, I think what comes to mind are two pieces of advice. The first is that you have to be unoffendable. So I think I've noticed at least in myself that I used to be very conscious of or self-conscious about how I was perceived. And this would kind of be a barrier to me really expressing my thoughts on a particular thing. And it was a very stupid barrier because it prevented me from learning properly because I would feel, oh, this question I'm about to ask sounds so stupid. And I don't want to ask the question. And because I didn't ask the question, I didn't learn. Mm -hmm. But I think nowadays, I'm becoming more and more unoffendable, <laughs> which means that I no longer have this barrier and I say what I'm thinking, even if I think it sounds stupid. And as a consequence, you... And as a consequence, I think I'm learning more. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and the second piece of advice is kind of always be very conscious of the environment that you're in. I think I did not understand the importance of placing myself in a good environment when I started my PhD. But I slowly learned that applying a strict filter on my environment was one of the most effective and efficient ways of improving myself as well. Because when you're surrounded by people who are positive, hardworking, and who enthuse you, then you find that you become one of these people as well. So if you just put in the effort at the start to select the right environment for yourself, then that can save you a lot of effort later on. Namely, the effort of kind of like making yourself excited about your own research, which can be very difficult when you're kind of in a place where no one else cares. Or, in, or if you're in a place where like there's a lot of hubris and people are kind of like always talking over each other and it's very antagonistic. So always try and avoid these environments and go to positive and constructive environments instead. That's a really nice thought, actually. Yeah, that's a really nice way to look at things, to seek out positivity that makes you feel better about what you do makes you mm -hmm. actually better at what you do mm -hmm. surrounding yourself with people who actually support you and encourage you mm -hmm. oh there's actually another thought that i just had mm -hmm. so i think that i've also benefited a lot from having many positive female role models in my life so as i mentioned just now during my high school times i was fortunate enough to meet dr hui kun Ng, mm -hmm. and she was a positive female role model and it made it made it a lot i think meeting her was kind of the catalyst that drove me to realize that there was an alternative career path to that I could pursue besides being a doctor or a lawyer, which are the two most popular career paths in Singapore or something. And I think that having a role model makes it easier for you to visualize what you could be. Mm -hmm. And when you can visualize something, then that's already half the battle won. So I think that something else we could do for increasing representation of women in science is to kind of more regularly highlight positive female role models. And I feel that I kind of do this to, I, I regularly engage in this exercise where um, if I'm feeling uninspired, I actually look up, I have a YouTube playlist where I save interviews with my favorite role models, male or female. But the point is that both of them are included. And Whenever I'm feeling in need of inspiration, I just like choose a random video from the playlist and play it. And and so I think that has been very helpful for visualizing what I want to be. That sounds like a really nice uh, constructive practice at uh, inspiring yourself when you're feeling down. <laughs> yes, thank you. And who knows? I think maybe, it's a good idea. <laughs> maybe someone out there will listen to this advice and maybe they'll put this interview with you on a playlist themselves. Oh, I mean, if, if I could help someone, I would be really happy. <laughs> okay, well, if our audience wants to learn a little more about you, then um, where could they find you on social media or anywhere else on the internet? 
Right, so my Twitter handle is Quack Pot Theories. I love your Twitter handle. Thank you. <laughs> I'm very proud of the pun. I made it up myself. <laughs> so Quack as in my last name, and Pot, and then Theories, and it's all one word. And anyway, I think you're going to link it. I will. We will make sure to leave a link to your, your Twitter profile on our website, which is insightquantum.org. We'll mm -hmm. also leave it uh, anywhere that there is a transcript of this podcast. So anyone who listens to this or reads a transcript will be able to track you down online and give you a follow on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much, Dr. Ihue Kwek, for your time talking with us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yes, it's been a pleasure for me too. And a great honour as well. This is my first podcast, so I, <laughs> oh, I hope it turns out okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks also to the Unitary Fund for supporting this podcast. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please consider liking, sharing and subscribing wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. It really helps us to get our guest stories out to as wide an audience as possible. I hope you'll join us again for our next episodes. And until then, this has been Inside Quantum. I've been Dr. Stephen Thompson and thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>